Hi, I'm Daryl Cagle, and this is the Cagle Cast. We're all about political cartoons, and today our topic is TikTok and China. Congress is considering banning the TikTok app because of security concerns about China. TikTok is already banned on government devices in America and many other countries. The app has 150 million users in the USA, and it's owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance, which under Chinese law must share their data on their users with the Chinese government if the Chinese government ever requests it. And TikTok has Chinese government officials on their board and is partly owned by the Chinese government. Notably, the TikTok app isn't available in China, where ByteDance, the company that owns them, runs a similar app called Douyin with far less content and that is highly edited and where children are limited to no more than one hour per day of use. We've got great guests today to discuss our TikTok and China cartoons. Dave Waman draws two comics and he's won a whole bunch of awards. Uh, so we welcome Dave. Jimmy Margulies appears on Kegel.com and politicalcartoons.com. He's syndicated to newspapers by King Features, and he self-syndicates local cartoons to New Jersey papers. Jimmy's worked for the Bergen Record, the Houston Post, AM New York, and he won the National Headliner Award, the Shetty Award, and Berryman Award. Patrick Chapat draws from Switzerland for the Boston Globe, Der Spiegel, Le Canard en Champ, Le Temps, and NZZ AM Sontag. And Patrick has say, the cow say, and sent juice say to the again, Martel. Say that again. Oh, you dear, got, my you French accent. almost right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Jace Graves is a nationally syndicated humor columnist who we syndicate at Kegel Cartoons. He's great. His columns run everywhere. And he's won a bunch of awards, too. And he's also a university <laughs> professor. And Jace is our first non-cartoonist guest on the Kegel cast. So uh, welcome, Jace. Thanks for having me with these uh, talented people. Okay, excuse me for reading these cartoons because this is also an audio podcast. And so if we don't tell people what's in the cartoon, most of them aren't going to have any idea. So uh, Patrick's cartoon shows two uh, Chinese government people at the door of a typical American TikTok user. And one says, the Chinese government now has information about you. The other one says, we know you dance to Beyonce with two left feet. This is very funny, Patrick. And it looks very authentic. Yeah. You, you, are you trying to Chinese accents? Well, every, every accent I do kind of ends up like a Russian accent. Yeah, that sounded Russian. <laughs> yeah. That sounded Russian. I'm sorry about Which that. Which still works. <laughs> all still right, I guess it does. Yes. This one I thought was great. You've got all the Chinese guys you know, looking at the screens, monitoring everybody in the world. And it says TikTok, a tool of Chinese spying. One says, one more Rihanna dance video and I kill myself. It's got to be a boring job. I think that's a great cartoon. Thank you. This is an absolutely brilliant cartoon, Patrick. That you've got uh, Xi Jinping standing at the gate of the Forbidden City with the big mouth. He's leaning in, covering your mouth's face with his face for a photo that's being taken. I thought that was just brilliant, wordless cartoon. And I got to congratulate you on that one because I think that's a wonderful cartoon. Thank you. Yeah, very simple visual, the kind of stuff we like. Yes, uh, China. China is a big source of inspiration. The, the whole TikTok uh, controversy, I chose to take all that with a little distance and, and, a, and a light uh, touch. Uh, and, you know, try to put, that, put this into perspective. Um, uh, if, if, if all the data that uh, the, the young TikTok users uh, are giving away are the, is them dancing on, on Rihanna, I think that's not, uh, that's not too much of a big deal. And of course, if we're talking about uh, you know, data being stolen on by, by tech companies and applications, we need to look first at all the damage that has been done in that regard by the big tech companies, mostly from America. So it's all a question. That sounds like, like a what about is some argument that we're used to hearing from conservatives. Oh, yeah. We should Maybe. pay attention to this issue because what about this other guy that's just as bad? No, it's not. It's not what about is is don't forget to look at both sides, and that's a discussion we'll have later when we talk about Chinese colleagues, because in their case, they have only capacity to look at the world with one perspective, which is not our case as cartoonists living in free democracies. Okay, gentlemen, are you just as concerned about Western companies harvesting data as you are from China? That's an excellent question. My perspective as a columnist, writing typically about family issues and domestic issues. I was going to tell Patrick, he did an excellent rendering of one of my daughters on that first cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mainly worry about, and I'm probably not as well-versed in this issue as others. I, you know, watch the news. I hear about the, the Chinese threat and so forth of TikTok. 
my main concern with TikTok is that it wastes time. I think it's a Chinese conspiracy to waste as much of America's time as possible because people stay on this app for hours. My daughters, my main concern isn't whether China is spying on them. My main concern is whether they're doing their homework uh, because they're just constantly on this app. True. Well, then we will move on to Dave Wamond. He's got the Republican elephant talking to the donkey. Republican elephant says, we can't just ban TikTok out. Right. We need the benefit. It's a kid. want to leave the platform. And uh, the donkey says, so make their parents talk so it's no longer cool. That's your plan. Daryl, yeah, so your, uh, your elephant sounded much less intelligent than your donkey. Was that intentional? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for me, uh, this is a no-brainer. It's like with Facebook, it was cool until the parents joined. So I think the problem solved if you just do this. That's exactly okay. right. I mean, it, it, I think TikTok's popularity has a has a finite lifespan. Mm -hmm. Like Facebook, you know, once the once our daughters figured out we were on Facebook, that was suddenly not cool anymore. Yeah. Once they figured out we were on Instagram, that was not cool anymore. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it'll be one of those things. Like ten years from now, remember TikTok? <clears throat> yeah, it'll be like MySpace <laughs> store. <laughs> exactly. The other things that went through a popularity thing and then fizzled out. You guys sound pretty confident of that. Okay, Dave, here's another one of yours. You've got a beaten up and injured Russian bear standing next to Ukraine with his broken tank and happy little panda dropping his boat into the water ready to blast Taiwan and Chinese panda says, Hey, that looks like a great idea. It kind of started off one, one accent and merged into another. That's what I do all the time. So. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, that, that uh, cartoon I, I did about a year ago now, and things were starting to not go well for the Russians and their invasion. And uh, I'd argue it's probably even worse now. So I, at the time, everyone was thinking that the same thing's going to happen in Taiwan. But I think China's probably watching the world response to this. And, uh, you know, I, don't, I think Putin thought it would go like it went in 2014. 14 when he dipped his toe into Ukraine and nothing happened. So I think he thought the, the world response would be, uh, you know, not what, a, what it is right now. So, Let's hope so. You wouldn't yeah. get a sense of that from their media. Um, right. It's really drumming yeah. up the war. Um, you know, I, I did some speaking engagements in, in China. And I've got to say, China is a wonderful place and everybody's warm and friendly on a personal basis. But you talk to a large room and they are very uh, militantly anti-American and very much like uh, they're at a football stadium cheering their team and booing the bad guys, I think it's kind of scary. Yeah. I came away from my visit to China thinking, wow, the food is great and this place is a real threat. It makes one worry that China looks at Russia like the pandas looking <laughs> where they're and thinking, you know, we could do this better. They're just doing it wrong. I've been to China a few you times. I, I even did uh, back then in the International uh, Herald Tribune a comics uh, story in one page. It was the extensive guide of what to do in less than half a day in Beijing. Uh, you know, sometimes you spend just a, a half day in a place and the things you see, even Chinese people from Be Beijing have never seen. I saw a dog in front of a restaurant and the dog was really slaughtered. I can tell you it's true. Um, and you can imagine why it was, it was, it was for the restaurant, uh, stuff like that, crazy things, but very, very, uh, fascinating place in, in, in the way that it's, you, you can see the past collision in the future in those places like, uh, like uh, Shanghai in, in some parts of Beijing and in places like Korea and Japan. Uh, what is very striking to me is that history in those uh, places of the world. If you speak to Koreans about Japan, if you speak to Chinese about Japan, they will right away talk about the past. The past has, has not been dealt with in Asia, the way it has been in Europe. The war has not been proceeded. So all these issues are underlying. There is, there is a lot of, of issues and sentiments in between the different countries. This is going to blow up at some point. That's the feeling you get when you travel to Asia. That was my feeling. I don't know about you, Derek. I went to uh, China last during uh, the time that they were having the big protests in Hong Kong, and I would watch CNN from my hotel room, and uh, it would just regularly go black for minutes at a time whenever Hong Kong was mentioned. I think that's 
pretty scary and telling. Yeah, I mean, it would go black for a half an hour if they were talking about Hong Kong intermittently for a half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, scary. Also, I did speeches with the U.S. consulates in some different cities. I was giving these speeches to college classes, and they'd have them come to the consulates to listen to the American cartoonist talk, who was really very provocative because I'm drawing images of our president and they're not used to ever seeing a cartoon of the Chinese president. So that's kind of a stark contrast for them. And what would happen was uh, the teachers would not come in for the presentation. They would sit out in the lobby while the students came in and listened to the speech because that way they had deniability about having heard anything that would have reflected poorly on them, which I thought was really pretty strange. Um, it's a disturbing place, disturbing to our values. Anyway, but we digress. We're going to talk some more about China later and talk, talk about what the cartoons look like in China. Jimmy, this is one of yours. You got a guy holding up a, a TikTok tablet and he says, China's access to Americans' personal data is a very big concern. And then he's got big, big tech behind him and he says, America's <laughs> personal data belongs to us. This yeah, I, this, point. this gets back to what, yeah, what we were just discussing. Uh, yeah, it is a concern that, that, you know, Google and its compatriots do harvest their information. And I guess the fact that it's China makes it a little bit more scary because of their, you know, authoritarian system. But the way I feel is that among the different things that we should be concerned about China, this is not the top of the list. This is maybe fourth or fifth. The, there are other activities around the world, certainly more of a threat to U.S. values than this is. So in some ways, I see all the hoopla about this as being a way of punishing China, but without starting a war or doing anything that is going to really you know, set off fireworks. Here's another one of yours, uh, looking at the bulletin board with a big notice that TikTok is banned due to a security issue with China. And a couple of people watching one says, don't tell me China wants to steal our dance movies. Yeah, this is, it goes Second along with a couple that uh, Patrick did as well, had the, the same uh, take on, on things. Yeah, one of my recent columns I wrote about my daughter, you know, they get in their beds and they, they have their phones in front of their faces and they're doing TikTok or making videos or whatever. And I mentioned that, um, you know, my daughter was, Exposing her dirty piles of laundry to the Chinese government, you know, for, for spying. And I was just thinking if I maybe posted a video of myself dancing, everyone would want to leave TikTok. That makes sense. <laughs> okay. This would Dibby is cute. And I love bath cartoons. Bathtubs cartoons are, are a wonderful trope that editorial cartoonists make good use of. And I love bathtub cartoons. So here's big Chinese battleship in the bathtub with little Chinese ladies says, I really need a restraining order on my crazy ex. And she's Taiwan because nice. she's got a Taiwan uh, talent. Uh, I think that's very nice. Her crazy ex. There was some Chinese naval activity uh, at the time I did this that was very threatening. So I, I think that was the inspiration for this. I put in three of my oldies with this. Here's another bathtub cartoon that I did when they were having all this naval stuff around Taiwan. And I love the bathtub cartoons. This is uh, one of the Winnie the Pooh, Xi Jinping cartoons. There's, we could have done a whole program about uh, Xi Jinping as Winnie the Pooh. We've got so many dozens of Winnie the Pooh cartoons. Uh, here he is uh, with the world tied up with belts. And he says, a few more belts and roads and I'll have this thing wrapped up. I like the Winnie the Pooh. I think cartoonists draw him as Winnie the Pooh simply because they know it annoys him. And, and uh, anybody in China that did that, they would go, uh, they, well, they'd get fired right away. <laughs> Now that we have the Winnie the Pooh horror movie that was recently released, is it called Blood think, and Honey? Do you think yeah, that people know what the Belts and Roads refers to? China is doing a international program with underdeveloped countries, uh, giving them money for uh, infrastructure as a way of gaining influence there. So, and the short name for the thing is Belts and Roads. And then they tie them up with all kinds of uh, debts and obligations right. and so that they're beholden to China forever to come. It's pretty insidious, especially through all of Africa. Here's another one about currency wars. You know, we have a whole lot of trouble with hackers at Kegel.com and very often they're Chinese hackers and they will leave files on our computer that are 
in Chinese because, you know, it's kind of like they're keeping their notes. They go into somebody else's computer and they just make a mess and they don't mind leaving their mess there. There was this one time when the NSA had their toolbox uh, breaking into websites uh, stolen. We found the whole NSA toolbox on our server uh, that they were just put it there because it's convenient for them to have it on our server as they attack our server. (laughs) It's crazy. And the Chinese are terrible at this. And we've got large parts of Chinese blocked out because that's where uh, we have hacker attacks coming from. And it just relieves the stress on our our servers. Uh, So So, this is an autobiographical cartoon about me getting hacked by the Chinese. Are are they doing it just to make mischief? Are they trying to hold you ransom for money? What's their motive in doing it? There are two motives to the hacking First motive is it's just the criminal stuff that you're used to seeing everywhere and they're fishing for credit card numbers. And then the second motive is political and they're from countries that really don't like our cartoons. And it's the second ones that are more concerned to us because we don't keep the credit card numbers online. And the second ones, uh, they so just want to cause so damage because, to us. I'm so sorry, Patrick? Enjoy, it's not because they enjoy the cartoons. Are you sure of that? <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Uh, and they are quite malicious. There's a couple of times where they have completely erased our servers, and it took us days to rebuild them. Uh, but wow. they're not asking for ransom, like uh, pay us off or, or we'll erase your server. They just erase the server. Um, no ransom demand. Uh, whatever they let, want to do to just cause us the most pain and cost. Let me do uh, some more uh, wataboutism, as you say. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the toolkit of the NSA, which reminds us when we speak about uh, spying through technology that the NSA started it all and is really mastering the, the art of uh, spying friends and foes alike through technology. Yeah, those bastards. Okay. Daryl, you look, you're much better looking than this self-portrait in this car. I used to have a, a white beard uh, for a few years, but my wife thought it made me look old. Yeah, you do look younger without the beard, I think. Mm-hmm. You yeah. do. Thanks, yeah. Dave. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go through some of our other cartoonists. This is Paresh Nath from India drawing uh, a Chinese spying Trojan horse from TikTok. Um, here is Monty Wolverton. Dad is yelling at son who's on the phone with TikTok. He says, no, TikTok, go harvest our data. And then he goes to the grocery store and puts in all the data with the <laughs> yes. supermarket loyalty program, harvesting data. This is from our Dutch cartoonist, Bart van der Leeuwen, who draws in a kind of a photorealistic style. And he's got little girl um, doing her TikTok video, but actually it's got Lee Jinping looking over her ominously. And, uh, that's, you know, I, I look at this cartoon and I think it looks pretty darn crazy. Um, There's Winnie the Pooh again. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Winnie the Pooh. I like the way he uh, snapped that in. Another one with Xi Jinping and his uh, TikTok glasses. He sees the world through TikTok. A Dave Grandlin cartoon with China taking their uh, their head off of their panda suit and it's spying inside. Uh, this one is a Frank Hansen cartoon. TikTok CEO Xiao Xichu is uh, with all of the angry people in Congress looking at him. Wow, tough crowd, says the panda. John Darko. Why can't a TikTok challenge ever be about studying, getting good grades as a school custodian? You know, the, the TikTok challenge where, uh, it was film yourself doing damage and being a hooligan at your public school. You guys have any experience with that? That happened at any of your kids' schools, Jace? I don't know if it was as a result of TikTok, but I mean, boys have been damaging their restrooms in public <laughs> schools for decades. If you've ever been into a boy's restroom in a public school, you'll know what I mean. I used to teach junior high at a public school. It was like a murder scene in there. <laughs> well, this now, really was a spate of vandalism tied to TikTok all happening at the same time and going online. Well, now there's one going with, with stealing cars. Apparently, Kias and Hyundais are uh, rather easy to hotwire. So there's a TikTok challenge and there's been a spate of car thefts with those type of cars that have forced the manufacturers to do some kind of software or, or some type of technical thing to prevent that from happening. So, hmm. you know, maybe that's more of a threat to, to our lives than Chinese harvesting our data at this point. We, we but, have warned our daughters about these TikTok challenges because they do pop up every now and then. And mainly we tell them, you know, 
if we catch you doing something like this, we'll send you technologically back to the 1980s. You know, the phone's <laughs> gone, the, the computer's gone. I'll give you a big, a big chief tablet and a box of crayons, and that's going to be your entertainment. Yeah. Didn't the whole Tide Pod thing start on TikTok? Because that one just blew my mind that they were actually, that was a challenge to eat Tide Pods. I, I can't remember it if it started that, on TikTok. It was somewhere online. I'm not sure yeah. TikTok, but definitely another one of these ill-advised uh, activities that people picked up on. It was very TikTok-esque. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. yeah. This was from Gary McCoy, the two girls with their phones. One of them says, my parents are so dumb. They say I shouldn't be on TikTok because it's ties to the Chinese government. And the other girl says, that is so stupid. Hey, let's do that new challenge where we become communists. Oh, you do the teenager well. That's your good thing. You know, really, if you've spent some time on TikTok, there seems to be just as much, if not more, uh, conservative leaning videos on TikTok as there are liberal leaning videos. And I don't know who's against China more right now in our government. It seems like it's, this is one of the areas where people can actually come together, but uh, it's fairly balanced. It seems like, uh, unless they're stealing your data and then they're therefore, you know, sending you the videos you want to see. How many of you are on TikTok actually? I've got TikTok on my That's phone, me. but I hardly ever use it. Yeah. My, my I, kids I stayed on, so. I, I stayed up too late last night looking at it. I'll admit it. So. I don't put myself on TikTok. That's, that's one of the fears I have about my children using it more than the Chinese government stealing our data. I'm afraid I'm going to wind up in a video. Dancing, dancing. Uh, I'm not on any social media now. I've, I've seen it uh, just by, you know, being observant, but I, I don't take part. Jimmy, you're my hero. I've been trying to wean myself off for years and, and you, you did it. So yeah, life goes on without it. Let me assure you. <laughs> so here's Larry. the whole. And who's, uh, who's detached from social media, member of Congress. And he says, I'm outraged. I'll do whatever it takes to keep you safe. Talk to the little kid. And the kid says, from mass shootings? And oh, funny daddy grandpa congressman says, from TikTok. And here's the kid with his phone, which is a TikTok, TikTok bomb. <laughs> I'm going to switch into cartoons from a Chinese cartoonist, Luo Ji who we syndicate, he's a cartoonist for the China Daily Newspaper, which is the national English language newspaper in China, which is owned by the Chinese government. I think Liu Ji is a good uh, lens into the media in China, their views of America, and uh, into what the cartoonists draw in China, because the editorial cartoonists do not deviate from the opinions that the government feels they should have. And they all have opinions that are very well represented by these cartoons that I'm showing you from New OG. I've talked to Luo Ji about this, and uh, I, I ask him, well, why have you never drawn Xi Jinping? You know, it's a measure of democracy around the world, whether a cartoonist is allowed to draw the leader of his own country. And, you know, more than half the population of the world lives in a country where cartoonists are not allowed to draw their own leaders. Um, so I think cartoons are the greatest barometer of freedom of the press of anything. And of course, in China, they cannot draw Xi Jinping. But well beyond that, they have a, a kind of an understood direction of what they're allowed to draw such that they don't actually push back on the limits like you see cartoonists in authoritarian states like Arab countries do. They're pushing back all the time and getting in trouble. Uh, in China and much of Asia, the cartoonists don't push back. They know what their limits are, and they just go along with it. I don't know that they are even motivated to push the limits. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if they would be allowed to draw something that, uh, you know, praising President Xi at all, or they just avoid it altogether. I don't think they're allowed to draw complimentary cartoons of Xi Jinping. It's so, just no cartoons. Words, there's the assumption that putting him in a cartoon is automatically... A, a, a derisive or ridiculing thing and they, they just can't depict him. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just understood that they can't draw Xi Jinping and uh, all, all these other red lines for them are also understood. When I talk to the Chinese cartoonists, that doesn't seem to bother almost all of them. I wonder if there are underground publications yeah. where cartoonists do that, that get shuffled around and distributed. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think this cartoonist, we will get, we'll see more of it. He's doing a pretty good job as a cartoonist. 
Um, and, and some of these cartoons I would find rather interesting and, and to the point, but the big problem being like this one, which is, which is a, an interesting critique, but the big point is of course, he's only allowed to one side of the story. And that's the case for all cartoonists allowed to do this work in China. A few of them like Bad Yu Chao, who got a uh, cartoonist rights network courage in cartooning award a few years ago, I met him in Geneva and he of course cannot, he had to flee China. You cannot live in mainland China or today, even in Hong Kong and do a critical work of the government, uh, the way we understand that in democracies. So he told me there were a few cartoonists as we define them. I mean, political cartoonists able to look at things with uh, some independence of view. There were a few of them a few years ago, but, uh, the government cracked down on them. Uh, mostly they were mostly on the internet and he was telling me, you can't find them anymore, even on the internet. He, he fled China and he worked anonymously and he wore a mask at, uh, public appearances. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting. We've got an anonymous cartoonist in our group and uh, we've had no problem about that with editors, but we get pushback from some of the cartoonists that are really annoyed that we do that. And I think, frankly, a lot of the cartoonists would be better off around the world if they uh, had the opportunity to work anonymously. What do you guys think? Do you object to our having an anonymous cartoonist? No, I mean, to me, it's like someone who is in another form of journalism wanting to protect their source in order to get the, the story out or the point of view out if they have to, you know, be silent because they are afraid in, in some way or another, but they still can communicate. That, that to me is, you know, tells a good story that, you know, they, it's important enough that they are willing to take that risk and do it. Yeah, we have two cartoonists in our group that were uh, put in jail a year ago for their cartoons. They did not draw anonymously, but I think they should have. They, they would have suffered a lot less. The cartoon you're showing to me really qualifies as a propaganda cartoon. And that's, that, there we're entering another uh, world, the world of propaganda. The features, the message, it's all uh, in one direction. It's very heavy, the, the, the representation. This, this cartoon is Uncle Sam drawn as yeah. Dracula with bloody fangs. It says, how did the yeah. U.S. drain the world's blood? Uh, one guy says, one tooth reads war. He's reading the blood on his tooth. The other guy reads the blood on the other tooth. Says the other reads dollar hegemony. Uh, Uncle Sam as a vampire is a popular uh, trope around mm -hmm. the world. Here is Uncle Sam, and he's yelling at a little guy holding a book that says Chinese collapse theory. And Uncle Sam's legs are cracking. And he says, when the hell will China collapse? If it doesn't collapse, it's going to collapse. This is very interesting. No, I'm going to collapse. <laughs> this, oh, oh, yes, I'm going to. This is a very uh, uh, broad uh, topic. All the cartoonists pick up in China, all the political cartoonists, about the West thinking that China is going to collapse, which is interesting because I certainly don't get that from my perspective in the West. The news we get is about how China is a growing threat and their economy is growing. And, you know, in 15 years, they're going to be the biggest economy in the world. And watch out for this. It's, uh, it's just the opposite of predicting that they're going to collapse. Uh, yeah, but... that must be a, a theme there, I'm thinking, because I, I don't hear that here at all or, you know, in any of the publications I read in the, in the U.S. either. So I, if anything, it's more they're worried that they're going to become the new uh, or, try, or trying to become the new world leader. There's really a whole lot of this in China. Here's a guy at the blackboard writing China is going to collapse in 2010, 2011, every year crossed out the next year coming up. This is an important part of their narrative. Yeah, well, maybe uh, the question is how many of you think the U.S. is going to collapse before China does? Um, yeah, what about that? To, back to his cartoon. I, I, again, a lot, some of his cartoons make really interesting and valid points and, and get you thinking. But uh, again, what is, what is really disturbing to me is the total one-sidedness of, of it. I mean, mm -hmm. he can present this perspective. He's not allowed to any other opinion. And we did an interesting experiment, which did not last long uh, back then when I was still with the New York Times. We started translating cartoons in Chinese on the, on the New York Times China website. And then they started uh, distributing those cartoons on social media in China. And I don't think many of those readers would have been exposed to the kind of cartoons we did uh, translate in China. As you know, too bad, um, the 
the New, York, the, the New York Times decided at some point, I think it was one or two years in the process of translating in Chinese to drop all political cartoons and my contract in 2019. But that was an interesting experiment. Well, let me add that uh, Patrick was a cartoonist for the international edition of the New York Times. He was in there regularly. And then another cartoonist who had nothing to do with Patrick drew a cartoon that was offensive and embarrassed the New York Times that they ran it. And the New York Times decided to simply not deal with editorial cartoons at all, ever again. And that was the end of Patrick's tenure there. Frankly, the New York Times has gotten into a lot more trouble with their words than they have with their cartoons over the years. I would much prefer to see that they just stop entirely printing words. <laughs> yeah, they just thought the cartoons were too complicated to deal with, or maybe too funny for them. I don't know. Uh, but you know, Daryl, it was not just about the international edition because the, new, the, the, the cartoons uh, 10 years ago uh, started being on the New York Times website, on the New York Times social media. And then uh, 2017, we started translating them in Chinese and, and Spanish on, on those websites. So they were actually, it seemed that they were in the process of opening up more and more to the cartoons. And then that happened. And indeed, they freaked out and took the decision that uh, it would be safer not to print any cartoons at all because cartoons can get you into trouble, which explains maybe why no Chinese cartoonist is allowed to draw Xi Jinping because you don't know, you know, a lot of things can happen in one single cartoon. That's... I wonder if the New York Times has a TikTok presence. <laughs> You know, just about everybody has a TikTok page. Well, anyway, this cartoon shows the Western media as Pinocchio, which is uh, pretty common in Chinese cartoons. They do lots of Pinocchios. He's holding up a, a long list of problems of human rights in Xinjiang, but of course his nose is long because all of that's a lie. And Uncle Sam looks at that without looking at the Middle East. Here is one of uh, Luo Ji's Hong Kong cartoons. Here's one of the Hong Kong protesters with his bloody knife and his Molotov cocktail uh, sabotaging the election, but he's really a marionette puppet controlled by the West because, uh, you know, all this Hong Kong business didn't really come from Hong Kong. It came from the West. Outside agitators. Uh, here is uh, clearly it was America that blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, not really much of a question. I think you're kind of getting the idea. I asked uh, Luoji, why, why is it you've never drawn Xi Jinping? Why is it you've never drawn anything critical of China? American cartoonists, most of our cartoons are critical of America. And uh, Luoji says, you don't understand. I'm like a cheerleader and China is my team. I think that's pretty much the attitude of the cartoonists in China. Here's Uncle Sam, the mosquito sucking the blood out of Taiwan, which is sucking the blood out of Taiwan's people. Because of course, Taiwan's people wouldn't support their government. Here's Taiwan's president yeah, even who's even though they uh, vote, they vote for them right they have the right to vote and here's uncle sam with a remote control controlling taiwan's president who is fighting with boxing gloves crushing all of the taiwan citizens one of the previous cartoons that you showed that depicted the um taiwanese terrorist i noticed that the it was a very stereotypical almost offensively so asian face on that character whereas these that you're showing now the faces look a lot less Asian um, than, the, than they did, the terrorist's face did. I don't know if that means anything or if there's anything to that at all, um, but the, the eyes on the terrorists were, were much more pronouncedly Asian than, than the ones on these others. Now, now that Jace um, brings that point up, I say, yeah, that, to me, it reminds me of the, the anti-Japanese cartoons mm -hmm. that circulated in World War II, where that, that kind of maniacal expression on the face, very, very good observation. There. You know, sometimes the foreign cartoonists in our group will draw cartoons featuring people of their ethnic group or their country in such a way that it is offensive to editors here. We get that sometimes with Mexican cartoonists drawing Mexicans with big sombreros. Here is Uncle Sam, the war addict with all of his... Uh, drug needles stuck into his arms, war, war, war. Here's Uncle Sam, the octopus, pouring gasoline and missiles and fire and grenades all around the world. And what Uncle Sam fears the most, what's on his mind that's most scary to him is world peace. Mm -hmm. And 
much less than world peace. He's worried about China. Well, I, I was noticing I didn't see any cartoons except for one that mentioned Russia or Putin. Are, are these, uh, is this particular cartoonist or his fellow cartoonists uh, allowed to comment on what's going on in Ukraine? Or is that also something that they just can't touch for fear of striking the wrong chord? I hear watching the news here about how China is picking up the Russian narrative about them really fighting NATO and not fighting Ukraine and a lot of the Russian arguments about Ukraine supportive of Russia. But I haven't seen that. It seems to me like they avoid the topic. I was just going to say, I, was, I thought it was interesting to hear the Chinese cartoonist's opinion of that he feels like he's a cheerleader for China. I don't Originally, know. I thought maybe they felt slightly persecuted that they might face retribution for certain uh, themes they might want to cover. Um, but maybe just that's the, the worldview of the news that they receive. You know, maybe it's slanted one way or the other and uh, uh, censorship maybe uh, comes into play there. So I have a friend who gets all his news from Breitbart and he's, on, you know, his worldview is quite a lot different. If that's, that's all that he's coming in and then all the, his algorithms from social media would cue to that. Relating to the very definition he gave of his work, being on Team China. That's the very definition of, again, propaganda, which is the opposite of political cartooning and what it should be. And I think in history, we have seen many cases where cartoons, which are a very powerful tool of communication and persuasion, have been used as a propaganda tools, you know, the Nazis and the Jews. So it's to me, it's really um, terrible to see that, to see the talent and the art of political cartooning being reduced to a propaganda tool. So maybe he's convincing himself, maybe he's convinced. Again, he's a, he's a crafted, uh, talented cartoonist. But if he was given the opportunity tomorrow to draw on whatever he wants and say what he thinks uh, about the government, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm pretty sure he would be doing different cartoons. I don't know. We kind of project to think that people would uh, want to criticize if they were free to, but I don't get that impression when talking to Chinese cartoonists. They don't feel frustrated. You know, you talk to cartoonists from Cuba, they've never been able to draw Castro. They really wanted to. They'll escape the country and do that, but not in that, China. Yeah, that's, it, that's it. If you live in a, in, a, in a prison, if you want, you have the choice to try to convince yourself uh, you have some freedom in, inside yourself. Uh, but you talk to Badu Chao, so you know what it is to be a Chinese. I mean, and, and uh, you know, I, they, they, yeah, that's, that's also someone... Uh, uh, who's very interesting to hear, the, the artist Ai Weiwei, they need to leave China. That's the, the only choice they had. You hear that from the Arab cartoonists, just about every Arab country, uh, they can't draw their own leaders and they're just as frustrated, but they push back really hard and they want to get out and have freedom to draw their cartoons. And I'm hearing that from more cartoonists in India as well. They're broadly not allowed to draw Prime Minister Modi. It's a a scary situation for them now in particular, as the government is coming down harder on the press. I think the situation no, in the world is getting worse. To your point, there is a cultural aspect of it. In Asia, for example, representing a leader or having this person, this leader lose his face through a caricature, that's something they are very uh, aware of. And that's cultural. That's one side of it. But then in India, you have different parties and they, they pick at each other, they fight each other, and you have different political visions and cartoons, which is not the case in dictatorships or autocracy, let's say. Scary stuff. Gentlemen. <laughs> I still enjoy a good Chinese buffet. Thank you for including me among these distinguished guests. Well, I hope you guys will come back. We're going to be doing one of these every week, and uh, I'd love to have you again. I have one question. Thanks. We mentioned TikTok. Uh, how many of us are on TikTok? How many cartoonists uh, feature their work in a way or another, maybe dancing with their cartoons on TikTok? Is That's that, a good question. Uh, I don't, yeah. seriously, if none of you have ever have been on TikTok lately, you ought to s either take a look at it or find someone who has it. And you probably, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know, it started out as this dancing app where people danced and posted their videos. It is bloated into so many other areas than that. I mean, there's comedy on TikTok. There, there is some dancing on TikTok. There are videos of police arrests on TikTok. There are television preachers on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And it's addictive. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you just get sucked into this rabbit hole of interesting things to look at. Similar to Twitter, I, I'm sort of... 
you know, the same way I spend way too much time on Twitter and it is addictive. Mm -hmm. So it cool. sounds similar to, and how Twitter started out now it's kind of, you know, since Elon uh, took over, it's become something else now. It was nice uh, meeting all of you. Yeah. You as well. Enjoy well, your very work good. online. Yeah. Take care. Same. Let's Folks, meet on TikTok uh, soon. Yes. yes. <laughs> we'll, have one, we'll do another podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the KegelCast. Subscribe wherever you're getting your podcasts. And if you didn't see the video edition and you'd like to see the cartoons, go to kegel.com or Apple Podcasts or YouTube or Spotify to watch the video and you'll see the cartoons that I only described in this podcast. Thank you for coming and I will see you on the next KegelCast. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.